So thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's an immense pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much, Kennedy, for this invitation. I'd like to start this, uh, this series of lecture of just sharing a Madeleine de Proust with you. This, in, this, in this very room, a long time ago, I saw my first math talk. It's the, 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 the very first one. This was uh, when I finished my undergrad in France, I came to Princeton for a semester. Uh, to do some research project with Ingrid Dobosheis. I did not expect that I would actually be a witness of these times. But then, and you know, it was wonderful to be introduced uh, to mathematical relations by Pierre. And then one day, a young postdoc came to me and told me, well, Pierre, you have to come with me. Um, there is a talk by Bourguin at the Institute. It's going to be extraordinary. You have to see this. It's going to be about PDEs. You will not. And then I said, no. Um, I said, no. <laughs> and the reason why I said no, is because back then I had a witness again, my English was a disaster. It was, it was really, really, really bad. I had a very hard time understanding people. So, you know, sitting in a room and I think someone speak English, I wouldn't understand anything. I said, no. and then so we are here to discuss with Fabrice and, and they told me, well, let me put it this way. With Borgia, as a speaker, English is not going to be the problem. <laughs> 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 so it is, a, it is, it is a special feeling for me to be to to. to be so I want to 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 talk. This is really an introductory talk today. I want to tell you about uh, energy spark critical. Point. I should. I'm sorry. I should also say. I'm going to do a blackboard talk. Because I have not touched a blackboard for the last three hours, so <laughs> this is uh, this is I could not resist this. So energy supercritical singularity uh, information. Well, let me start. There is, of course, a very 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 famous problem in this field, and maybe let's just talk take just take ten minutes to, to talk about it because it, it's a famous problem. It's it's the regularity problem for uh, the navier stokes equation of of mathematical fluids. So what does it look like? What does this problem look like? It typically looks like this. So you have some evolution of some function. So uh, let me explain what this is. So u is a vector. So time is the time variable. X is space. And typically, u is a vector in space. And you ask for u to satisfy this, this evolution equation. So this is the gradient. These are just derivative in space. So okay, p is pressure. And divergence of your vector field is zero. But you don't need to know anything about this thing. The, the point of view that, that I want to take, you know, this is a PDE, but I want to think of it, this is just an ODE in a balanced space. All right, so what I mean by that is that at time zero, it gives me an initial data, which is U not of X, which is in some balanced space. So I'm typically going to take the superlab space HS of RD, and I'll remind you in a minute what this thing is. So what is this thing? H is the norm. It's simply the fact that I'm asking for my function to be in a two in space, so integrability in space. And I'm typically asking for derivatives in space of my function to be also. This is, this is my HS. Okay, so I'm just asking, I'm just asking that my function is in a two, so in space it's integrable, so typically you get at infinity. And I'm asking for control of, uh, of, of, of derivatives, right? I'm asking for S to be large enough. Okay, so, and the point is the following. If you start there, then people work hard for you and tell you, well, there is no problem. You can make sense of it. So there is a unique strong solution. So it's, it's, it's your ED and your evolution is going to take place. Yes. And you really solve this. You really should think that you're solving this on a Cauchy sheet. And what you have is a, is a blue up criterion. So if T is the maximum lifetime, is the maximum lifetime of your solution, again, exactly as if you had a the problem, then you have a so-called blue up criterion. What you know is that if the lifetime is finite, then actually your norm must explode. It must go to infinity at your time of uh, when you approach the time evolution. Okay, so you really have, it's just an ODE, it's an evolution problem in your Banach space, and you typically, you can take the simplest possible Banach aspect you, 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 you want to, to 
So the famous question is the following: Is it possible that there is this data in the Linux space such that lifetime is correct, which would correspond to cellular information? And the beauty of this problem, and this is just what I want to review to, 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 to make co co connection, the beauty of this problem is that the answer is no, in dimension two. This is Loray, 1934. This is something absolutely So Loray gets the answer, the answer is no. And it's, it's very nice to review what's, what's going on here. So how, how could you do so, so, something like that? There are just two things you need to know. There are two, two uh, uh, fundamental facts. Fundamental facts. The first one is that you have a conservation law, which in this case is, uh, is a gap in the form of notion. There is a, 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 if you compute the evolution of the L2 norm, so you integrate the L2 norm of the function. If you compute this, and maybe there's a half somewhere, then you get some 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 something minus. It's a monotonicity for that. It simply means that along the flow, this quantity is under control, and actually the space time integral of this one is is is, is under control. So this is really this is the dissipation of energy. Fact number one. And this is a magic identity. I mean, it's sort of the identity. It corresponds to a constellation uh, uh, in the nonlinear in the nonlinear interaction of, of the flow. There are no. This is really there are no. It's not like there is a Navi or such formula. It's sort of the formula. Fact number two: there is a symmetry group acting on the space of of, of solutions. The symmetry group. So what is this symmetry group? It's, it's scaling. So it's the following fact that you give me a solution u of t and x. I can pick up another one for you by looking at one over lambda u of t over lambda. Where lambda is positive. Okay, so it means that you have a transformation. If if a solution is given to you, you can form another one. By the way, I'm sorry, there's a square here. What it means is that you're changing the size. You can change the size of the solution and it still is a solution. And now the matter of fact, so this is true in any di dimension, this is true, it has nothing to do uh, uh, with dimension. Even now there's something very special in dimension two. Dimension two, when you compute this quantity, that is the L2 norm, which is the guy that's under control. So if you compute the L2 norm, the lambda uh, L2, but actually it's equal so maybe time is dilated. Okay, which means what? Which means that the L2 norm is critical. L2 norm is a critical. And you can see that, and you, you, you can tell me what, what it means, and this is sort of the modern thinking about all this, what it means is that this norm is a very strong norm. And actually, uh, uh, it will, you can use you can use this identity. You can use your your flow. You, you can compute. And first, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This identity. I'm sorry. It's of course it's in dimension two. This is critical in dimension two okay? because it's one of a lambda. You get one of a lambda square. Okay. So in dimension two, so it means that the the the, the dimension two problem is not too critical. The two is under control, and actually, this is exactly what Lorry could do. Lorry could prove that this norm is an extremely strong norm, and it allows you to completely control your flow. If you go to dimension three, the critical norm is no longer two, you need to take half the derivative. One derivative more. In some sense, it means that L2 becomes a very weak norm. You will need to control more, uh, 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 more regularity of your solutions, but you do not have any information, no a priori information. Okay, 
it's very simple. If you want to control your flow, if you want to think that your flow is going to, to be global, if you want to show that the solution will exist forever, will remain regular forever, you need to, to control a norm which is not which control is not given to you a priori in dimension three. You have a so-called energy. And the question of whether singularity formation can occur for strong solution is, is, a, is a remains as of today uh, an open point. So, in the sense of the criticality, is the criticality of the norm, it means that for higher or, or lower uh, norms, it would be in a, it would be inequality for one of the. Yeah. So, the, what, what I want to say is the following: If you want to control your your nonlinear flow, you want to control your D, you need to put your hands on the norm. Which you don't control. Okay. So this is the simplest. You, you're missing in dimension two, you control a very good norm. It allows you to understand everything. In dimension three, there is, there is no obvious way of putting your hands onto this. Okay. Sometimes, Nadia and in the, in the 60s observed that there are classes of solutions, uh, typically solutions with special symmetries, for which there are more conservation laws. And these conservation laws are so strong that then you can actually get control again of your, of, of your solution. So there are special uh, uh, solutions with symmetry for which you, you can actually co conclude. But apart from this, uh, uh, it's, it's an open point. So this problem, so I, I will not speak about this. Let's speak about incompressible fluid anymore. I will tell you more in the lecture about compressible uh, fluid. But there is a problem which I want to uh, 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 another problem. So to this problem belongs to the class of energy supercritical problem, and I want to show you another uh, cl class, class classical problem. So which is uh, about nonlinear Schrödinger So something that has a very similar structure, and in fact, if you want, there is uh, classes of models related exactly. Uh, to these kind of questions where you have a similar structure and when the exact same type of questions uh, 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 can be asked and sometimes we know, sometimes we don't. Okay, so, and I want to talk, I will, I will uh, uh, mostly fo focus on my lecture on this uh, and also on, uh, on the fluid. So what does my, my PD look like? So it's, it's the sort of the simplest possible uh, uh, nonlinear model. You can think of something that in many ways is much simpler than than, than this structure here, even though it's deeply connected. So it looks like, like this. So you, you have the linear Schrodinger rule. So you have the Laplace. So uh, let, let me put this way. So U is a complex number. So T uh, is my evolution variable. T is time. X a priori is in R D. Okay, I have a complex number. So the Laplace is always uh, the Laplace in, in space. So I'm taking the derivative of space here. So I have. Uh, d square j, so if you want d square xj, u. And so, so this would just be linear dispersion uh, 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 wave. And then I add, I add a nonlinear term, and to may, maybe for these first lectures, let me put a minus. So I put a minus u modulus of u to the p minus one. Okay, so p is a parameter. Is, P is given to you, so you, you take P is just some, some, something that is, that is strictly bigger than one. And you should think of this model. This is really, so this is this would be a linear problem. This can be integrated explicitly in Fourier. And this is a nonlinear problem. And in some sense, you know, there, of course, there, there, there's a very strong background for certain ranges of nonlinearity and dimension, uh, physical background of this equation. But I want to think of this. This is really a toy model that has attracted an amount, an immense amount uh, of work. And this is a toy model to understand. And really, the idea is that this kind of nonlinearity is the simplest kind of linearity that you can put with non trivial structure. Okay? There's a hand structure hidden uh, uh, in here. And this is, this is uh, it's really one of the simplest possible models you can think of. OK, so what should you know? About, the, uh, about this, well, you, what, what you should know is exactly the same thing. This is an ODE in a black space. And I would be more precise in a minute, but typically you can take just your favorite subordinate sub space, HS of RD, just take S large, S large enough. Okay, so again, you give me a data. I can look at the, at the evolution of, of my data. I have a unique 
uh, and I have a, a mixed strong solution. And then exactly like I had here, I have two fundamental features. I have the conservation law. Here there is no so the fundamental conservation law here, so it would be uh, energy. So the energy of U, which is the kinetic energy that is a half the integral. So you integrate the square of derivatives in space solution, and then you have a plus because your nonlinearity, I put a minus there to this generated plus here. This thing, so I have one over P plus one integral over R D the modulus of U P plus one X. This quantity, which would be so if you want the natural Hamiltonian associated to uh, this thing, this quantity is conserved. <laughs> in time, this will not this will not move. So if you start with the data for all time, you have the energy of U, which is equal to the energy of U naught. So what I call U naught of X is just it's, it's my data. So during the evolution, this quantity is under control. It's the sum of two positive quantities. So both these norms are under control. Then you have actually a second conservation law, which is the, the, the conservation of energy. Uh, the, the conservation of that, sorry. So the delta norm. So, uh, so this is and, and as a matter of fact, you have. Uh, so these are conservation law, and you have a symmetry group. You have a symmetry group that acts again on the space of solution. So if U of T and X is a solution, I can modify it. I can form one over lambda. I have some numerology here. I have one over lambda to the two over P minus one, U of T over lambda square over lambda, which I will call U lambda of T and X. Next, this thing is a, is, is a solution. Okay, so you have a symmetry group acting on the space of three. And now, what you can do, and you have to, 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 to understand. So, this is very, very, very important. So, if you dilate space by a factor of lambda, you need to dilate space by lambda square. This is dictated by your linear rules because I have one derivative in time and two derivatives in space. Okay, so this is a linear non number. This number over here. Is dictated by, by the nonlinearity over there. Okay? So if one number is linear, the, the other one is, is non linear. And what I can do is I can compute the, the so called scaling exponent. The following number. So you ask yourself how many derivatives? Possibly fractional derivatives, but it does not matter. How many? So let me call SC, the SC like S critical. How many derivatives? Of uh, uh, the dilate of U, but you, you, you measure this in the two, are left invariant by the equation. So, which is where is uh, uh, so what, you, what you're looking for is what is the, the critical? I want to ask you. Thank you. Okay, so you're asking what is the critical norm? So it's, it's exactly the, the similar question you're asking. So you're asking which topology, and you like to, to measure things in L2, at least to the start, it, which topology does not see the fact that you're changing the size of, of, your, uh, of your solution? Okay, so you can do this computation. This is very easy. It will give you a number, but, but so it's actually the answer is SC is D over 2 minus 2 over T minus 1. Which is just something that you compute. But this number is, is a very important number when it comes to understanding the qualitative properties of, of the flow. So, what's going on here? If you start with P small, so you have really three cases. <clears throat> like three cases. This one. You are below the energy space. SC is less than one. This means that you are energy subcritical. 
But it means in this case that you, you see the number of derivatives that you need to control the, the flow is less than one. Okay, and as a matter of fact, you control the flow for zero derivative, but you also control the norm with one de derivative. So in fact, in this case, thanks to your conservation law, thanks to the conservation law, critical norm is about it. It's sandwich, if you want. So if you want, this is zero, this is, uh, this is one, you are here. This is where your critical number here, and you have a conservation law here, a conservation law here. So essentially, essentially, you in business, things are under control. So you you certainly need to work. So this is really this is this is this is a really uh, uh, the 80s. So Jimmy Brunvelo prove where did they prove? They they show that in fact this thing is an only in the energy space so that you can show that you can take uh, actually S equal one, which is the energy space as your Banach space. You are, you are already in the Banach space and you could show, they could show that if the light time is finite, then the H1 norm must explode. Let's go to plus infinity. C equals to T. They could get the standard Cauchy uh, Lipschitz uh, uh, block criterion in this space. But now the matter of fact, this norm, the H1 norm because you control energy. This, this norm is, is, is under control. You have a uniform norm. You control this. This is under control because of conservation law. So T is specific. Okay, and actually, the difficult part of this proof is certainly not the conclusion. The difficult part is to actually show that, you're really, that your PD is an ODE in this space. And this is really the starting of the introduction of harmonic analysis techniques. Uh, uh, into the world of, of Cauchy theory, what's behind this is three classes. So if you work hard enough, you have to, you discover that in the energy subcritical case, so if your nonlinearity is not too big, you can make sense of your flow in a space for which you control everything thanks to conservation law, so there will be no singularity. It's even better than that. You can work harder and understand that, in fact, if you think in terms of, of a dynamical system, any solution is attracted to zero in the sense that asymptotically, all solutions in this case will behave like a solution of the free world. It is asymptotically in time, it is as if the nonlinear term uh, uh, did not play any role anymore. So you have a complete understanding of uh, the flow in this case. So when SC is one, This is the energy critical case. So SC equal one is the energy So what it means in this case is that the critical norm, the critical norm is exactly uh, uh, the H2 norm of the gradient. So you could tell me, fine, this is perfect. So because I control it, but it's a borderline case. It means that it's not because you control this norm that you control your Cauchy theory because you're just borderline. What it means is that this broad criterion here is not true. It could very well happen that uh, in this case, norms could concentrate. So you could control this quantity, but you can have a direct mass for, for formation. There is no obvious reason why you could, rule, you, you could rule this out. So there is a possibility of a, of a concentration. Concentration of the, of the, of the critical. So this problem uh, has attracted uh, uh, an immense amount uh, of mathematics. Bourguin in 94 was the first one. Bourguin in 94 was the first one. To give an answer, and, and then this has been revisited in several ways. And this led uh, uh, also, there, 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 there is a slightly different way to think about this, which is the Kenningham approach, which came later in 2006, and the uh, fundamental way worked by uh, uh, Satidani. I'm forgetting a market and cause Q. Okay, so really this is this is this was this was a huge 
It was a huge deal, but so what is the point of this thing? You learn something. So how, how do these people prove regularity? So this is really about proving regularity. This is about proving that singularity is scalable. And there are always two ways of doing it. Either you can sometimes directly prove it. It's exactly what uh, Lerae did if you want to. In the case of Radius Stokes, this is exactly what he did in 2D from scratch. He could prove directly that the singularity could form. He could control his flow from A to C. But, but what Morgan has started doing, and which is the end point in the Kenigman approach, is, is, a, is a slightly de, de, different proof, which you could think of it this way. The way you're going to prove that no singularity can form is by saying the, the, the following one. So you think in terms of dynamical system, the first thing you need to know, and that's sort of the consequence of the Cauchy theory, is trick estimate, is that if your data is small, well, there's no problem. Small data will not form any singularity. Your flow will be global and solutions will be. And then you start raising the level of the energy. You start making your, your data work. And you say the following words, assume that the singularity forms somewhere. Okay, then what you want to do, you want to extract the first singularity, the smallest one. Okay, you want to say, well, if a singularity has formed, initially there was no singularity, I start to curve. If a singularity forms somewhere, well, along this curve, there has to be a minimum singularity, the smallest possible one. And then you show that such a minimal singularity actually must have very special properties because it's a minimal singularity. Borger run an induction uh, on energy argument, can it be also extracted if you want exactly the limiting singularity. So what you are left with is classifying uh, the possible solution. So this solution, this very special solution that, that, that could support mm -hmm. the singularity formation, that they must have very specific properties and you are left with classifying this solution. Okay? And in this case, because you have a defocusing nonlinearity, because you have a minus sign here, you can show that there are no such so solutions. So in particular, a key step in the proof is that there are no solutions. What is a soliton? A soliton, there are no solitons, and in fact, so what is a soliton? A soliton is typically a solution to the stationary equation. This guy would be the typical candidate for to be able to support the singularity formation mechanism, and in fact, you, you can, so that's ruling uh, these guys out is easy, but it's sort of a key. Uh, 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 step in. So if I summarize, I have the, the following thing. Cauchy theory, subcritical energy, uh, Cauchy theory, this was a huge deal in the 80s. This was completely understood. Critical case, you know, amazing words being, being done on this. And sort of the endpoint story of this is if you had a singularity, you would have the smallest one. It would correspond to a very specific solution of your flow. You classify your endpoint. They don't exist. Okay. So the question is what about? Uh, if you go beyond, what about SC? <laughs> what about? Is this a solitary solution? Sorry, sorry? Is this a solid or just a stationary solution? Yeah, yeah exactly. So the fact that they don't exist plays a key role okay. uh, to rule out the possibility of, of growth. I could say this the other way around. If I put a plus, they are solitons, and this thing will form singularity. The, the, the energy critical point. So it's not a direct relation, but you know, if you start flip, flip, flipping the signs, completely new nonlinear structure arise, which indeed will make this uh, concentration of energy mechanism possible. Okay. All right, so the question, the, 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 the open problem is what happens in the energy critical regime? Let's see the other one. Do you have global regularity? Does there exist? Does there exist data you know, in, in, in nice so space? So such time actually the evolution with the fact. So Morgan himself thought that uh, at least in some ranges of, of parameters, thought that uh, there should be, I mean, this was sort of the dominant thought, especially after this, this, this work, that there are, there are no, the fact that there should not be singularities was, was essentially what was expected. And there, there are two, two, two very interesting things that could be done. There's, there's been numerical experiments that have been run on this. 
um, that sort of indicated that you know people you feed this to a machine, you let things evolve, you don't see singularities form at all. You see the wave packet start spreading and things get attracted to a, to a zero. At least this is what you extract from this paper. There is also some, something else, but there is a very, very simple problem. But in some sense, all straw share all this structure, and for which I can give, give you an answer from scratch. So this problem is I can simplify again. You see, fluid is not clear, and the lens is not clear. Let's do a problem for which some sense is completely trivial. So I simplify my, my equation again instead of giving you uh, a nonlinear Schrodinger equation for defocusing. Let me make it even simpler. Let's remove the I and just look at this. Okay, so this is just a nonlinear heat equation, nonlinear heat. Okay, so now U is no longer uh, uh, a complex number. U, I'm sorry, U is real now. Yeah, but then, so you, you, you could say you have exactly the same kind of structure. Everything I said so far essentially would apply to this problem. So I could very well put myself in a situation where SC is strictly bigger than one and ask myself, uh, am I going to have uh, a regularity in this case? So the answer is, is completely trivial. Uh, the answer is yes, you have regularity here for the following reason. So if this is X, and if you draw U of T and X, and so you are in your Banach space, your Banach space, you have your flow, so your Banach space implies in particular that your solution must be bounded for all time. The soup norm must be attained somewhere. So let's take a point where you attend its soup. It looks like. Let's take a point where you attend its, its maximum. But then the Laplace at this point is going to be negative. U, so typically the maximum is for you positive. This is my energy. U is positive. So this thing, this expression is negative. So this thing is decayed. So I have a Yapunov functional. The soup norm of my solution is decayed. Okay, same, same thing from below. So you have, in fact, it's like you have a hidden monotonicity formula. You, you have control of the soup norm, which is a super critical. End of story. The flow is global and you have a very regularity. Okay, so it's completely trivial in this case that actually you have global regularity for all solutions. You have T even positive. Okay, so in some sense, the only defocusing supercritical problem that you know has, uh, has this regularity. Uh, so the claim is that this will not be the case for NLS. This thing, uh, so I erased it, but the NLS problem is more complicated. And in fact, you see, this is something this is some, something that is very clear. What is the big difference between this and this and this? And I could write down the fluid equation. Well, there's a big difference. This is a scalar equation. This is a system between the real and the imaginary. Okay, so the dynamics of these things are likely to be much more rich than what you, you could find here. I'm not even talking about, of course. Uh, uh, in, in incompressible. So the intuition here is here. So what we um, prove so with uh, uh, now so myself asking is the, is the following thing. It is that uh, so typically, for example, let's take an example. So if I take dimension five equal nine. You have to trust me that SC is one. Then there exists data. I can find you can find data for, for you, which are going to be in any sort of space uh, uh, you like. You know, if you want to have an field, they are as smooth as you want. There is this data such that the unique strong solution, the evolution, will be formation of the same. Okay, so it is absolutely the case that even in the defocusing setting you may have formation of singularity. And I can actually, so this is not uh, an abstract existence statement. This is really, uh, uh, this is really we, we, we actually give you a complete description of the nature of the singularity. And I think it's, it's actually interesting. It's sort of, 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 of canonical of the kind of things 
uh, uh, that that counter. So we typically have so this is a radially symmetric function. So R is the modulus of x, where x is the vector x one x t. So if I draw, let me try to draw the solution for you, give you an idea of what it looks like. So this is this is u of t and r, and this is going to be uh, this is going to be r. So of course it's a complex number, so it's a, it's a little bit schematic, but let's just have an idea. So what you want to do is you want to draw this function. You want to draw the function e to the i divided by r to the alpha divided by r to the beta. Because this is a particularly unpleasant function. So this is should think that you have something like let me erase this. One. So maybe I'm putting something like one over r to the alpha here. And what you want to do is you want to make this guy start oscillating like this as R approach the origin. So this is what our function looks like. And what is the singularity formation mechanism? The singularity formation mechanism is that this function actually will smooth out at some point, full stop. Okay, so it is a smooth function, but if you want, there is a, an inner layer here, which is a dynamical layer. So I'm, I'm always smooth, but as time evolves, this thing shrinks and I oscillate more and more. Okay, so this the, the nonlinear term creates this 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 uh, very high. So there's this, this is with the boundary layer, boundary layer. Yeah, yeah. So I so absolutely so. I will <coughs> be in particular precise uh, in lecture three. Why do we need exponents? What governs the choice of these exponents is something I will explain very carefully. Okay, so this would be this would be this would be. That. I'm just giving you an example. If I knew how to do all the cases, I would tell you. I don't. So so what we know how to do is is uh, uh, construct some examples, which in some sense was sort of the. Uh, 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 what we wanted to do. This is, this is the, the first thing you, you want to do. So let me say, and this is something that you should expect uh, in the setting of singularity format. The, the caveat here is that you, this is not about taking any alpha and any beta, right? The number alpha and beta are quantized numbers. You need to choose these guys very, very carefully. And I will explain again uh, uh, how, how, how this thing what governs the choice of these uh, uh, of these parameters? So you understand that the heart of this picture. Of course, this picture is really what you see from outside. This is what you see from far away, which is just very unpleasant in the sense of small squares. Of course, the heart of the matter, and this is what people in the singularity formation problem have been doing, you know, for the last thirty years, is what happens in the boundary layers. I mean, what is this dynamic here? What is going on inside there that makes this kind? Uh, 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 of singularities uh, possible. Let, let me also say the following thing. Uh, when dimension is three and four, our construction, this construction uh, it does not work. And in fact, this is actually uh, very interesting. What is behind this? And again, this is uh, this is exactly what people have been looking for and found in some uh, cases, which I will explain. You know, this is not just about being energy supercritical. There is, of course, a supercritical numerology. There is a universe in the world SC bigger than one, and we're just at the very, very, very beginning of exploring this universe. So, what is coming here? What is behind this is that, in particular, you need the existence of specific. Nonlinear structures. And on these structures, sometimes you think they exist, but you don't know how to prove it. That's most of the time. Sometimes you have no idea what they are. This is probably most of the time. And sometimes you can prove that they exist, but then you immediately understand that they exist only in some regimes, in some regime of parameters. Okay, so this is exactly what is going on here. This, the, 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 the fact that you can find alpha and beta, the fact that this structure exists, the fact that you can actually zoom on the formation of, on, of the singularity here, 
relies really on, on, on the fact that specific object a, a, a exists, and this relies on the numerology. The numerology gives you no control in the dimension 24. Bigger than five? Sorry? Bigger than five, you have examples. So d equal five, t equal nine, and we did, I think we, we went all the way until dimension 10. Okay, so again, I will explain very carefully what governs, because this is a key question, what governs the choice of the, of the exponent? Again, if I knew, if I had a full range in all cases, I would tell you, we don't, okay, we just. Yeah, yeah. Please. I'm trying to explain this in more detail, but so your initial data is a smoothing of that? So, so for all time, for all time, I'm smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, like, it's, uh, so you... that's by that. Okay, and you and you and you let it go. Okay. Uh, okay. So that. Yeah, yeah. So the oscillation stop. This is the picture. No, I'm just I'm just looking at the formula that you that you give. Yeah, yeah. So it's a smoothing of that function. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and it's radially symmetric. Yes, uh, absolutely. R is the is, uh -huh. is, is the modulus x. So the radial symmetry is not perturbed. It's like the singularity, like it's, it's smoothed. Yeah, yeah. So so this equation uh, uh -huh. propagates uh, 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 radial symmetry. Okay. So in some sense, it's the simplest possible mm -hmm. dynamic structure that you that that you that you might be looking for. Okay, so it's so a absolutely all our data. You know, when, when it comes to singularity formation, I like to think that smooth data matters in the sense that you want to make sure, especially when you, you know, when you do a dispersive problem which propagates singularity, you want to make sure that you did not put the singularity in the data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is no singularity in the data. The data is infinitely smooth. It decays at infinity. It's a cute, nice guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, it, and for all time, it is so. It's just that in finite time, this thing, you know, my boundary layer will shrink. And what you see at low time is really this, that function. is that function near the origin. In fact, if you want, if you can think of it this way, you can think that if I strictly positive, okay, what happens is that um, if you look at u of t and r, it will have a limit t goes to the time for r strictly positive. I will call this limit u star r. And what will happen to me is that the now you have the equivalent of u star r as r goes to zero. As this guy. So you're really drawing outside. So here, if you want the blue upset is i equals zero. Mm -hmm. Outside the blue upset, you have some profile which actually depend on your data. But the universal behavior on the singularity does not depend on the data. It's given by, by, by. Yeah, and this and the fact that there is such a profile, etc., is something people learn how to do that typically on the nonlinear linear equation. Right? The, the fact that there is a picture like, like this from the outside, that the singularity looks like this, this is some. Some, something classical. What maybe is not is that my profile is that awful. Right? This kind of oscillations, as far as I know, was, was not seen. I mean, I'm not aware of other problems that could create that. Okay? There is something really, the fact that it oscillates like crazy like this is something uh, I had not seen. The decay of infinity, is it the power law or does that, does that not matter? I'm sorry, can you say that again? For R going to infinity, it's the same power law or? Anyway, so, so you should think that again, the, 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 the singularity is happening here. What happens outside is irrelevant. There is a limit if you want the flow, pick an R strictly positive, go to block time, the flow U has a limit as T goes to block time. The only point where it gets crazy is I equals zero. So if you said, if you want the blue upset, which you want to call the blue upset, that is the, the set where actually you don't have a limit if you want. It's really just I equals Yeah, please. Sir. So that kind of begs the question, if you come off the critical norm, can you then continue the dynamics on the other side of that? So, so the critical norm in this case, and this is something that was more recently, there are, there, are, there are more results of power actually, uh, uh, and other people on, on well, in whatever norm, can you go to the other side of the critic of the blow of time? No, no, no. So, so this is this is continuing singularity formation is a very interesting question. There are there are various ways in which you, you can think about the typical way in which I like to think of singularity formation is the following thing: give me a perturbation of my flow, give me epsilon times something such that all solutions are global. Okay, you know, add, add some very strong dispersion, add something that kills singularity formation. And then you have a solution, u epsilon of t and x, okay, for all t. 
And now what you want to say is, okay, so if epsilon was zero at x equals zero, I have a problem. So the question you would like to ask is, you owe you, you epsilon of t and x, or let's just think of it as a function of r. Okay, what does it converge to when t goes to t? You know, for time, of course, for time bigger, you know, when epsilon is zero, you take a data, you would predict singularity formation at time zero. You put an epsilon, you can continue the solution beyond the singularity. So the question you ask is what happens beyond the singularity when you let epsilon goes to zero? Okay? And that's a complicated problem, but that's a zoo. We have examples where many different things can happen. Sometimes the data disappear, sometimes it keeps exploding, sometimes it oscillates like crazy, sometimes you want to really focus. And sometimes there are so-called uh, phase instabilities. That is, they're, they're, you, know, you have a profile, but what are they doing instability? It's a universe. But this universe is understood only, the first thing you need to understand is the singularity. Once you've understood the singularity, you have a chance to ask this kind of question. You first need to understand the singularity. Do you have similar results for the wave, not only your wave? This is, this is an absolutely fascinating question. So indeed, so for the, uh, the wave equation, so I have, I have dTU minus Laplace, you're going to make it different in this case. Yes, we have exactly, again, everything I said for this problem uh, uh, with the plate to here, there's a difference. This is a scalar problem, okay? So we don't have an answer. I don't know. What we do, what we do here does not apply here. You know, so we don't know. So you don't have no, no, no the point is completely up. If I make it, I make it uh, complex, then, then what? Oh, that, that would be a different stuff. If you make it complex, that would be a different stuff. But if you so you know, if you make it complex, then then indeed what we do, you know, it certainly gives you a starting point to try and start investigate these kind of questions. If you make it scalar, real scalar, real, real scalar, then you know, this is you know, it seems like uh, if you start doing what we want to do, you will be stuck. Very, very fascinating problem. So the regularity problem here is completely open. You know, this, this, this is interesting. You put the heat equation, it's trivial. You put Schrodinger, and I will have an answer. But well, this is this is a fantastic point indeed. This is a wonderful point. This the scalar, and and, and for Schrodinger again. Uh, they, they are, it seems, international three and four, what we do here, uh, that, that, that does not work. Okay, so I will, uh, uh, so in the remaining time, I want to give you uh, um, a fair overview of what has been done, uh, what you need to do to understand this kind of singularity and why, why these guys are in the picture. But I cannot do that. I cannot do that, or maybe I should say, has been done here in some sense is a new step in the long story okay and in particular the story of singularity formation of course you have all these beautiful uh, uh, and famous problems for which you do not even know if you have singularity formation but there are also tons of problems for which so problems for which existence of a singularity is done. So what I, what I, what I, want, I want to show you some, some example of, of this problem and, and, and give you a feeling of how the study of these models, which uh, at first hand seem very far, both from fluid mechanics uh, uh, or from, uh, from, from this data In fact, it's really the study of these problems that gave us the, uh, you know, that allowed us to create a connection to a, to a discussion. So let me give you a problem. So for which problem do we know that singularities will form? Let, let me, so let, let me stay with my Schrodinger equation. Let me take exactly the same. Let me change the sign of the singularity. I put a plus sign. Assume a non radial initial condition. No, so the theorem is there exists. Yeah, that was a radial example. Yeah. And if I start. So, so if you start perturbing non radially this example, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a problem. Producing non radial data you know is, is, not, is not the issue. I mean, okay. it's, it's not an issue. It's not, you know, the way things are done, I don't think it's, it's, it's an issue. 
And at the end of the day, you know, when, when you say non-radial, that is, if, if I do, you know, if I take a non-radial data, but the essence of the singularity is radially symmetric, no, this is, this is not exciting. What would be exciting is to find really completely non-symmetric structure, really different, that would, you know, that would sort of be able to do some, something like this. This is, this is a different problem. Okay, so sometimes perturbing to have non-radial is easy, but to finding truly non-radial structure, this is a different problem. So, Pierre, you're saying that this blow up is stable. No, no, no. So, some small no, 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 so it's, 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 it's a finite co-dimensional thing. There are always finitely many instabilities okay. that, that may happen there. Mm -hmm. So if you start making small non-radial modification, mm -hmm. you should expect that you have to adjust everything. Mm -hmm. okay? but, but, but you know, the fact that we reduce to radial flow and that we do only radial solution, is, is, is not essential. What is essential is that the study that's being done here, and I will explain in details, is, is you can do it because it's radial. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now constructing the full solution, radial and non-radial, it's about you know, closing a certain number of things. It's, it's, it's not a huge deal. Mm -hmm. It's not the heart of the problem. Okay. Okay, so let me give you, so let me take exactly the same equation. So uh, you so this is my nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I just changed the sign, so this is the so-called focus of time. So what, what changes in my problem? Well, it's very simple. What changes? So everything I said about Cauchy theory being in the, the Banach space, this is this is all absolutely the, the same. But there is a major difference. If I look at the conserved quantity, the energy now is no longer normal. So if you compute the energy the solution, now the so this is conserved by the four, but you have a minus. So the energy. So this quantity is invariant in time, but you do not control the norm. What could very well happen, so this is constant, if you want, this is equal to energy of data. But what could very well happen is that this guy explodes and so does the, this guy. And this actually happens, okay? And so this, is, this, this, this kind of problems, it's very easy to show regularity formation. So how do you prove regularity breakdown in one line? So there exists there exist solution such that in finite so not all solutions will be smooth for the following reason we do the following computation it's a computation we compute the second derivative of uh, the variance of the solution why not i mean you, know, it's, uh, you, you do this and what you discover is that uh, in a suitable range of parameters, so you need, you need P to be large enough, which P needs to be greater than then this is probably, this is less than 16 times the energy of the data. This is a computation. Okay? This is purely algebraic. This is a free line computation. So what you learn from here is the following thing. If you take a large data, you know, now your energy, it's very easy. It's very easy to see that for a large data, the P is bigger than one, so you just take the multiply the data by a factor number, this is going to dominate. So it's very easy to create data. So you pick a data, you know it, such that its energy is negative. It's tricky. Then this thing is telling you that if you draw the function, so this is uh, time, you draw the function the integral. Uh, x squared, x squared. Then what you're learning is that it's below an inverted parabola. So this is some parabola, which is dictated by this uh, 60 e mod t squared. Okay, and you have to be somewhere over here. Okay, but you have to be below, which means that this positive quantity has to become negative or maybe touch zero. I mean, something bad has to happen to it. And in fact, it's very easy because of your Cauchy theory. This means that it's an obstruction argument. You cannot live forever because because you you, you can't because you have sort of you have a barrier function. Okay, so this is this shows you that 
you know, you should not think that you're proving anything about singularity. You're proving that T must be finite because it cannot be infinite. Okay, so this is a so-called DIL. Okay, so you could say maybe, maybe this argument, Say. Maybe it's very special. Maybe it's a completely ridiculous argument. So there are two things to say about this argument. First of all, it's extraordinary because it actually tells you that singularity formations happen just in two lines. Okay, so this is beautiful. This is this is immediately telling you that something like work will occur. This argument uh, uh, is terribly bad because it tells you nothing. So may, let me. Before telling you why it's bad, let me say that it's not restricted to, to these equations. Actually, there are quite a few models. There are other models for which this argument works. And there's a very famous, in particular, set of problems, which I will introduce next time, which is the setting of compressible free dynamics. And actually, this kind of argument in this setting is the series of Thomas Sigaris back in 1983. This is exactly what Sigaris do for compressible fluids. So it's the Navier Stokes equation, but not the incompressible regime, the compressible regime where density is, is allowed to uh, vary. This is exactly what you have to pick in 3D. What you have is uh, 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 existence uh, uh, of singularity formation because of this kind of argument. This can even be propagated, actually, this is more recent. This can also be propagated to this case. So you can even add viscosity in dimensional part. This is a paper by Rosa Nova, so this is more recent, more complicated. But this is also very, very, very interesting. In dimension three, you can add viscosity to your fluid. So it's the compressible radius Stokes equation and discover that, again, singularity formation is possible. However, it's the typical situation. This is something that uh, that's, uh, 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 is typical in this field. This real argument is a disaster. It, it, you know, it tells you that you cannot exist forever, but it typically gives you no information on the nature of, of the singularity. It is so much the case that, you see, this could predict that maybe the time of singularity is when this function vanishes. Right? But it's typically not the case. Europe typically happens before, way before. Okay, so this field has exploded much before anything bad happened to, to this quantity. It has nothing to do with the singularity for, for, for emission. So this is, this is, you know, we have sort of, you should think we have two classes of problems. We have problems for which singularity formation is completely unknown. You don't know if it forms or not, if it exists or not. And we have problems which in some sense are even more frustrating. You know that singularity forms, but you really don't know how. So the, the question becomes, how do, can you describe Possibly sometimes classification. And you know that it can happen, but literally you have no example, and you should think typically that from CDR's proof to the first description uh, uh, of singularity formation in 3D compressible fluid which is Christo de Lou in, in 2006, there is almost 20 years and, and there, there is a reason for it. So next time I will uh, uh, be a little bit more specific on compressible fluid, what is going on here, and I will make a connection between in particular uh, uh, viscous compressible flow and the Schrodinger theorem uh, that, that I'll explain. And then once this connection will have been made, I will explain you how the understanding of in particular this kind of uh, nonlinear focusing model or even heat nonlinear heat equation focusing model will give us sort of the keys uh, to enter both compressible fluid and uh, the defocusing energy problem. This is really something that has been done in continuation of uh, 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 you know immense amount of work which started you know like uh, forty years ago. So I'm done for today. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Can you explain what alpha and beta, how they depend on 
on the exponents. Absolutely. If I don't, you remind me. But <laughs> I will. This would be part. Absolutely. You know what this they is are. Where they come from? Yeah, and you, and you know that you know them explicitly. The quantization conditions. Uh, explicitly in, in terms of what? In terms of formula? Yeah. No. We know that there exist numbers that behave like this. That do well, that's that. coming from the, some dynamic picture. Absolutely. It's coming, it's coming from uh, what I told you, it's coming from existence of suitable nonlinear objects. You want some structure to exist, these structures are contact. Are they, are they like a resonance? You tell me, it's a good question. I, mean, I will show you uh, this. They will be on the board on, on lecture two on, or lecture, on lecture three. three. I promise. <laughs> lecture <laughs> three. <laughs> we, have to plan, we have to plan our week. Yeah, this was planned. Yeah, the same thing. The singularity of the one point. Yeah, yeah. Not a long something I don't remember. Is it because we are in small dimensions? So this is this is an excellent question. You know, there is a very famous theorem, for example, for incompressible fluid. You know, the 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 Kaplan-Lipton theorem tells you that if you take incompressible and distorts, the Hausdorff measure of the possible set of singularities, so the points where the singularity can occur, the Hausdorff is zero. Just like something you cannot go up on the fractal state, which which is you know, very general statement. But as a matter of fact, 40 years after the theorem, on much simpler models, even just take the nonlinear equation, the only examples of finite energy singularity formation of blue set that we have are one point, several points, and spheres. I'm not aware of anything else. Even an ellipse is not there. And it would be actually very interesting if one, someone could you know, take one of these simple models and make it work on an ellipse. I don't know. I think it would be. You know, it's not like we, we don't know why. I think you know, we are in the process of slowly understanding what possible structure can emerge. But it's true that in terms of description of the blob set, it's a little bit pathetic. We have points and So you have a question from the back, right? Yeah, so for, the, for your theorem, for these infinite oscillation solutions, have you been able to observe those in like numerical? So, so I, I, you know, so I have not seen, I'm not aware of, of the presence of such highly oscillatory ph ph phenomenon in other blob, blob setting. I've not seen it. Uh, numerically, uh, you know, all I know numerically on the case of the defocusing analysis is all, all the numerical works I know, um, what people show is, is you know, just that the flow would become regular, and that, that, that you would have regularity. So I think it's likely that uh, uh, the kind of solutions that we exhibit here, this kind of dynamics, it's certainly it's part of the proof that there is possibility of uh, uh, finitely many stabilities, and not finitely many eigenvalues that are possible di di directions to exit blow up. Okay, so counting them explicitly is a different problem, but it's likely that this kind of thing is is on table. It's, it will not be the first time. You know, we have this problem, uh, for example. Ten years ago, we, we proved the uh, uh, the uh, singularity formation for the energy critical wave map problem. It's a problem for tons of numeric simulation have been done, and people did not see singularity formation. And that's just because it was a stable by rotation. That is, it's something concentrates, but it goes so much to term. And if you don't synchronize the two, one wins. You see, so seeing this on the computer, seeing actually the, the thing go all the way to the singularity seems not to be. It's sort of too delicate to capture. It seems to be very, very, very delicate. But there are some experts. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I talked a lot to at some point to, with, with Gabi Fibich, for example, in, in, in Tel Aviv, who worked a lot on, on this numerical simulation of, of singularity formation. I think the game is the following. If you know what you want to see, I think you can manage to see it. If you, but if you're looking just out of the blue, you know, just exploring your face space and you have no idea what you're looking for, it seems like you miss it and there are reasons why they miss it. Isn't it true that uh, Christodoulou found these examples in relativity and then they found them numerically? This is possible. Yeah, yeah, this is possible. Uh -huh. Absolutely. They did find it, and they only believed it when they found it numerically. Yeah, no, <laughs> I've seen this. I know, I can believe that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's bad, uh, but when you talk about numerics, it's, a numeric is like the simple brute force, just, uh, just do this thing on a, on a very small. On a very dense lattice, or is a, no, no, it's a, 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 a more analytic way of. 
No, no, so you know, you, you know if you read Bogan's paper, <laughs> this is the Millennium paper in the Millennium Jaffa. Uh, so this was from 2000. Bogan said on this problem, what we know is that if we get control over, over the, 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 the Strickers norm, and you, the idea is that if I give you the data, you know you have an estimate of how long you must wait. You know, there, 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 there is a time that you can reach, and you know that if you've reached this time, you're done. You know, the singularity cannot happen any later. So this is definitely a machine. He says it's explicit. This is a machine to put this in a computer, try and, you know, some various sites of data, try to explore and see, try to compute Strecker's norm, et cetera. And then you know that if you reach some threshold, then you don't need to go any, any further. No, well, I'm, I'm, when you're talking about the data, we're talking about the continuous thing. And are you, are you discretizing the, the d-dimensional space or? I, I did not run any sort of numerics. I'm no. just reading what these people tell me. And, and this is what they tell me. How they do it is, I have no idea. That's, that's a job. Not, I don't know. <clears throat> So, so what you said was all on the full space. What about the yeah. So you know this is this is on, on the so this is this is indeed on RD, so on the whole space. Singularity in this case is a local space. Singularity, this is the blob set. It's just the origin. Okay, so you chop my data, you put it anywhere you want, and you manage to attach it to anything you want. It has nothing to do with the real identity. Ah, the, uh, the very identity is in the whole space. Yeah, typically, if you start, this, this, this argument is awful. You perturb your with anything. It can completely collapse and you lose the conclusion, which is completely ridiculous. Okay, so this kind of proof typically gives you existence of singularity in some cases. But when you have the complete dynamical picture, like what I showed you, this picture has nothing to do with being on the whole space. You know exactly how the singularity forms. You know what happens outside of it. So you can chunk it, put it on a domain, put it on a manifold, put it wherever you want. It's the same thing. It does not influence the formation of the singularity. Because you know where the singularity is. It's just a point. Okay, there does not seem to be any more questions. So thank you again.